Um, yeah, I was given this really rather challenging title, <laughs> The Future of Natural Capital, and um, I'm not really sure I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, what I thought I would do is to um, just draw together some of my thoughts about uh, where the natural capital agenda is going and some things that we may need to concentrate on a bit more in the future. <coughs> and uh, so it's a bit of a personal um, perspective and although I'm a member of the Natural Capital Committee and earlier today I was talking in that capacity, I'm now talking, I'm allowed to talk as me. So um, <coughs> don't take this as an NCC perspective in any way. So the first thing is, you know, as, as we've seen in the last few days, or last two days, natural capital is really taking off as this rather inclusive framing. And I think it's really good to hear how people from many different sectors, academia, NGOs, <coughs> business, government, uh, big corporations, and even the financial institutions, can use the nat natural capital framing. And I've put here deliberately that it's an inclusive framing for environmental sustainability, because I think it's really important to bear that in mind, that the reason that we're thinking about natural <coughs> capital is um, for environmental sustainability. And environmental sustainability means maintaining life support systems for the overall benefit of humankind. It's to, uh, it is ultimately to benefit social and human capital so that and improve the overall well-being of society. So it is an anthropocentric framing. And um, <coughs> that's just the way the capital argument goes. Um, I think there are some challenges around the deeper environmental agenda that the natural capital agenda doesn't comfortably sit with. But given all the pressures that there are on the world um, and the need to maintain a large and growing human population, many of whom <laughs> um, are now living in difficult circumstances that are going to get more difficult, I think environmental sustainability for human well-being is an absolutely key challenge that natural capital can help us with. So that's my framing for it. And I've always rather liked this strange um, donut thing that Forum for the Future put together because I think it illustrates really clearly that everything ultimately depends on natural capital um, and that all these human social assets and the things that uh, we all really care about depend on natural capital and then though those things that we count financial manufactured capital depend on both human social and natural capital so it's this Im entirely supporting framework. So what I want to do very quickly is just answer these two questions. Where are the gaps in embedding these ideas in practice? And what do we need to do to ensure that they deliver what we intend, where, where what we intend is environmental sustainability, as I've described it? And the first thing I'd say is, and uh, I've strengthened my view that this is a problem in the last day or two, that we need a more common understanding of concepts, terms and principles. We're using natural capital in a whole variety of different ways. And there are many ways in which we could use it. And I don't think we all have to do exactly the same thing. But unless there is at least some coherence and focus, it won't deliver what we intend. So I'm going to give you my very um, basic <coughs> conceptual view of how all these things fit together. And I apologize in advance that I've built my career on being rather bad at PowerPoint and it's too late for me to change now. <laughs> so if this looks amateurish and clunky, that's because it is amateurish and clunky. Okay, so here's how I envisage it, that natural capital is a stock. And that stock includes ecosystems. And ecosystems are not everything that's in natural capital because there's things that are non-living in there. And ecosystems are complexes of biotic and abiotic things interacting, that's their definition. And part of ecosystems is the living bit of ecosystems, which sometimes we call biodiversity. And the rather neat thing about biodiversity is it has a capacity to replenish itself. It re renews itself, and more than that, it's very efficient at taking energy and turning it into other forms of energy, and it evolves and adapts over time. So within this natural capital area, um, biodiversity plays a very important role. But all these things are stocks. They're just sitting there waiting for people to use them. And the reason that it's natural capital is because ultimately we rely on it for these benefits to people. 
And the flows of benefits are what we call ecosystem services. And these things, provisionally regulating culture and so on, are some of the um, ways that ecosystems provide benefits to people. But they don't do that on their own. The only way that we get these benefits is by putting other sorts of capital <coughs> into it. Human capital, um, you have to think about it, you have to plan it, <coughs> produce capital, you have to have transport systems, you have to have uh, engineering and so on. So they don't just arrive by themselves. And also, there are some of them that don't rely on ecosystems. Some things to do with energy, minerals, um, come straight from the abiotic world. So just looking at um, ecosystem services is missing a whole uh, set of the complexity here. Now, the other thing about this diagram is, if you think about it, when we ask what the value of natural capital is, one way of getting that is just adding up the value of all those benefits to people. <coughs> But the value of those benefits to people changes over time and space. Uh, we had an example yesterday of whale oil, you know, that it, and, and yet what we want for sustainable natural capital for human well-being is for that to be maintained for all time, for people in the future, not just for people today who happen to particularly need a lot of iridium or have a particular um, liking for popcorn. So we, so we need to have this natural cover so, so it provides a sustainable flow of benefits. And so just adding up the value of those ecosystem services uh, only gives us part of the picture. And I, I think there's still an open question about how we do the valuation of natural capital. So the way we do the valuation of benefits to people, well, one thing you could do would just be to add up all those benefits for the whole world, for everything and call that the value of natural capital. But it's not really very useful to do that. So the more useful thing to do is to say, let's think of different configurations, components, uh, ways of managing that whole stock of natural capital on the left, and how that would benefit the net <coughs> set of <coughs> ecosystem service benefits <coughs> for people under these different kinds of conditions. And that would then show you that there are some ways you could run the world that would give you a net um, increase in the benefits from ecosystem services for people. There's some ways you could do it that would uh, increase it in the long term compared to the short term and vice versa. You can also take this and divide it down. We could say this is this system just for the UK. And then of course we have the option of getting some of these benefits from outside the UK. Getting our food from elsewhere for example or um, putting it, doing our recreation elsewhere. We could do it for a city. Uh, or Rather interestingly, you can just take the bit on the left and be a landowner and ask how you manage that set of uh, natural capital that the landowner has in order to deliver a set of benefits that's most profitable to the landowner. And if all landowners did that, you'd get a different answer than if you optimise it over the whole country. And then, of course, what a lot of business um, operations and users of ecosystem <coughs> services do is look at it from the right-hand side backwards. So you're looking at a production chain for food, fresh water or something. And then you get into the um, issue that there are trade-offs between these ecosystem services. As you manage the ecosystems for more food, you may, for example, uh, lose the ability to maintain many regulating services. So there are many complexities here, but I think, and that's why we need to have a coherent framing of it so that it's clear that the activities going on in one area are actually not contradicting those going on in another. And that as far as possible, we can try to get the outcomes from many different initiatives in natural capital to actually be lined up and not competing with each other. So the, se so the second point I want to make just generally is Natural capital is about people. It's not about ecosystems. I'm an ecologist. I've spent a lot of time working in conservation. And I can tell you that that stuff on the left-hand side of the diagram, the environment, will be absolutely fine without us. Uh, it will all go on doing its own thing and its own processes. Um, so there is a whole argument about environmental sustainability for the benefit of the environment. But I don't think that's our central concern here. It's environmental sustainability for people. And that means that these definitions that we use and the concepts that we use 
need to be framed in that way. And it makes this issue of what natural capital is, how we measure it and its benefits very significant. It raises the um, importance of values and valuation because um, many of the values that people have, both for now and for the future, may not be easy to, to turn into monetary units um, that make decision making easier. The valuation also raises the issue of the targets. What do we want from natural capital? Which bits can we actually um, forego? Because we're fairly sure that there are some short-term priorities um, that are going to mean we can't keep everything. Which are the elements that are going to be important in the future that may not be important now? Which are the ones that we can replace with technology? Um, and which are the ones that we will never be able to replace with technology? D here, I think, is incredibly important um, about equity and fairness because the way I've described this, there, there are a whole set of decisions being made about natural capital. How these many benefits are managed, for whom, when and where, under what circumstances. And so there's a set of rather fundamental concerns about who's making these decisions on the basis of what set of priorities um, and values. And that, um, I think, we're starting to encounter in some of the discussions that we've had here. And the other thing that's really interesting about this whole debate is, I think, because it arose from the natural science side rather than the um, societal side, that we tend to think about it much more in terms um, of the supply side. So a lot of this mapping, for example, is about what ecosystems do. We very rarely look at what people need. We're not looking at the demand side. Um, and that, of course, relates back to these targets and values for the future. So we're, the, we need to refocus a bit on the demand side and then um, align the supply side around the demand side. Um, well, of course, I'd have to say this, but I really do believe that ecology matters. Um, these are natural processes we're relying on, the very wonderful things that ecology does in terms of ecological processes and functions. And there are ways that we can make um, ecosystem services much better by exploiting those. Agriculture, um, water purification are great examples of that. But there are, um, there are some hard realities. And as uh, the Rolling Stones put it, you don't always get what you want. And that's because of these thresholds there are some biophysical limits and thresholds that however hard you, how much you want something, if you push the system too hard, it may fail to deliver it. And we need to know that ahead of time. We need to understand that those systems um, and their interactions and, and functions that provide those limitations. Location matters. Uh, many of these things are not properly exchangeable across place or across time. And I think in the future, uh, just because of the number of people and the demands they're putting on land and, and sea, that we're going to need to have more multifunctional landscapes. We're going to need to do more than one thing on the same parcel of land. We're no longer just able to do food over here, wildlife over here, water over here, and have some cities on the side. And so there are huge challenges for the biophysical side in where and how these multifunctional landscapes are going to work best. And then finally, there's this scaling up and scaling down over space and time, uh, where also there is interaction between the society side and the ecological side. So having made the emphasis that it's all about people, uh, you have to have the, the natural science as well. I just wanted to emphasize this, that um, I think uh, every, almost every ecosystem service and every benefit we get from natural capital is co-produced. There's a few that you might argue come all by themselves, fresh air or um, scenic views or something, but mostly we have to uh, do something as well. People have to work, I have to produce some other capital. And that means that this accounting and looking at the different ways of, of living in a finite world has to take into account all those other things. And there were some interesting talks earlier today uh, looking at um, the, the whole supply chain side, that sometimes it's that interim, the moving stuff around, rather than the products themselves that dominates the, um, the natural capital impacts. And 
it's worth thinking about because I think it brings together again this people and nature side that, that some of this local specificity um, is very much tied to scales of production that people have grown up with, that they're accustomed to using and some of the big stresses come from when you push those beyond the scale of time and space over which the biophysical processes allow them to function. So I'll just finish with some unresolved issues and I, I think these are all things that, um, that we need uh, to think about a bit more. I th there's a, there's a, a range of concerns about valuation and yet it's absolutely fundamental to everything here about whether it's, whether it's monetary or non-monetary. Um, actually, if you think about the big sustainability agenda, which is about um, a good quality of life for everybody, then it's more about measuring health and well-being and less about money. So somehow we've got to get this balance right between what it is we're able to measure, the common currency that allows decisions to be made, and what the overall objective at the end of it all is. Um, there's a, a complicated set of um, issues about intrinsic values, which I've heard mentioned several times, which I haven't got time to talk about, except to say that I think there are some intrinsic values that come into the well-being agenda. <coughs> but often what is meant by intrinsic values are values that have nothing to do with people at all. So they're actually outside um, the human capital discussion, human natural capital discussion. Um, there's definitely more to do on equity and fairness, both intergenerational and um, within our own society, uh, and particularly the decision-making around natural capital, because there may be some very profound decisions being taken um, where there are some important groups of people who've not been considered in them. Uh, I think there's a tricky issue about accounting for natural capital versus valuing ecosystem service benefits, <coughs> both because of the way these values change <coughs> over space and time, but also because of the difference between measuring stocks and flows. And because some of these stocks have some very particular dynamics that mean you can't continue to pressure them forever and that you may want to do something different with them in the future. And I, I've been very interested reading some of the stuff around cost-based accounting rather than value-based accounting, which just makes the statement that there's certain levels of natural capital that just should be retained because we don't really understand what they're doing and tinkering with them would be too risky. And so then the value of them is just the amount that it costs to maintain them. And I think that alternative way of looking at valuation is very interesting from a capital perspective. Um, this has come up in discussion a few times as well, but we've talked a lot about valuing and accounting and um, uh, the cost benefits and so on, but actually turning that valuation into making better decisions is a step that we haven't really cracked yet. So just being able to say what's worth more than the other and perhaps do the cost benefit doesn't necessarily enable the best decisions to be made. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, and this touches on something that Mike said as well, um, this, isn't, th this is very easy to frame in terms of risk to be avoided. Um, evaluating risks, identifying the biggest risks, um, but actually there are also opportunities to be realised. And that's particularly important. Right now, we are in a world that's changing very rapidly. We have um, unprecedented climate change, population growth, um, big problems to do with water availability, pollution, um, sea level rise, a whole range of things. We no longer live in a very stable, predictable world. And natural systems are here because over millennia, uh, they have proven themselves able to adapt and persist in a, in a rapidly changing environment. And I think natural capital um, is one way that people can uh, find new tools and mechanisms that are gonna help us cope with this very rapidly changing world. And in many cases, uh, natural capital solutions will turn out to provide better opportunities for people than some of the engineered or technological solutions that don't have or aren't able to exploit this remarkable ability of natural systems <coughs> to adapt, evolve, um, and take care of themselves. So I think as well as 
uh, all the risk ag agenda, we should look at this as an opportunities agenda to actually try and make the world um, a better place for people and for nature. So thank you very much.